Well, a good evening and welcome to all of you joining us again for another edition of Scripture Night in America. My name is Pastor Steve Wagner and I am here with you live. Um, well, it's live anyways if you're watching on February 7th, 2024. Uh, so we are back to being live because I was off traping around the country, slacking, being slothful on vacation, uh, terrorizing the state of Texas and other areas of the South. But I am back now, ready to go again for another live edition of our weekly online Bible study here from Lombard, Illinois, Trinity Lutheran Church. <clears throat> so, we're going to dive right in. However, a little bit of a curveball is going to be thrown because uh, instead of looking at the text for this coming Sunday, which isn't a bad Sunday to look at since this, since this coming Sunday is the Transfiguration, of Jesus. Rather, today we're going to take a look at Ash Wednesday's texts because, believe it or not, and it just doesn't seem fair, one week from today is Ash Wednesday in the beginning of Lent. So, since Lent is starting, Ash Wednesday will be next week. Let's go ahead and take a look <clears throat> at our Ash Wednesday texts. I thought we would. So, we're getting started with Lent, even though it's a little early for it, but hey, I didn't write the calendar. So, uh, our Ash Wednesday theme for our texts is Genuine repentance and faith saves and is in the heart. Genuine repentance and faith saves and also it is truly deep in one's heart. So, So, um, our Old Testament lesson is Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 19. The gospel lesson for, Ma for um, <clears throat> Ash Wednesday is Matthew 6. So, let's go ahead and get started <clears throat> by putting up Joel chapter 2, the Old Testament lesson, 12 through 19, Let's read it and get started with our special Ash Wednesday study. <clears throat> Joel 2, Return to the Lord. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. <clears throat> Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Then... The Lord will become jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. <clears throat> All right. So we got a few of the standbys with us. We got Lori, Barb, and Annette. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, perhaps others, if you are there but haven't spoken up, I do not know. So please join us. So what you just heard, again, is from the prophet Joel. Now the prophet Joel is writing to the people of God at a time where they're kind of way off in the weeds spiritually. And this is a call <clears throat> by Joel for God's people to repent. Now... That literally is the exact purpose of Ash Wednesday. If you're sort of new to all of this lectionary type stuff, you may have noticed a bit of a pattern, and it, it's all by design, and it's pretty cool. 
The church year starts in December with the season of Advent. Advent is a time of joyful anticipation for the earthly coming of Jesus. And that's sort of like when you have, um, if you're excited about somebody coming for a visit, uh, you have that joyful anticipation that they're going to be here. Well, we know that we have this problem with sin, so Advent is about the excitement about knowing that our Savior is coming. <clears throat> then the festival of Christmas and the season of Christmas came where Jesus actually came and we celebrated the coming of our Savior. Then that transitioned into the season of Epiphany. <clears throat> and so Epiphany is... Epiphany is the... Um, so now that Jesus came at Christmas, who is he? What do we know about this Jesus? So Epiphany told us who Jesus is, namely Almighty God in flesh. And that culminates what will happen this coming Sunday at the Transfiguration. In the Transfiguration, the text when Jesus takes a couple of the apostles up on the mountain, starts glowing whitely, and of course the white glowing represents his divinity, showing he actually is God. So if you want a text that removes any doubt that Jesus is, in fact, God, well, the transfiguration is it, and that's the, the culmination of the season of Epiphany. Now, after the season of Epiphany, we transition into the season of Lent. So you had the joy that the Savior's coming, then the Savior came. Now that the Savior came, who exactly is this Savior? Well, God in flesh has come. In Lent, we start to address the issue of why he came, because Lent is a focus on our sinfulness, and our, not only our sinfulness and the severity of it and the seriousness of it, <clears throat> but also it shows the fact that we need a Savior. Now, we have that Savior in Jesus, and so Lent is going to culminate with Holy Week with Jesus actually saving us, Good Friday dying for our sins, Easter Sunday rising for our sins, and then the next season after Lent is the Easter season where we spend uh, a month and a half or two months uh, rejoicing in the new reality we have now that Jesus rose from the dead. So in this season of Lent, we focus on our, we take time, we should take time, about six weeks, to focus on our sin and the problems that it causes. So, what you heard Joel say, he's calling the congregation to repentance. Lent is God's, in the church year, is God's call of us to repentance. Um, in the season of Lent, you ought to take time and, uh, you know, kind of take inventory of things in your heart and your mind spiritually. If you do that and you're willing to be honest with yourself, uh, as, me, as myself, same thing, you're going to see an awful lot of sin. Um, and so Lent is important because Lent is about repentance. Repentance is important because if we don't repent of our sins, then we're not going to really have see much of a need of a savior. I mean, if I'm a pretty good person and I don't have much to repent of, then Jesus dying isn't really a big deal. It's a nice story, but I don't really need that. And so Lent is very important because it shows us our true need of our savior. It gets our hearts in a right place so that um, when the savior comes, we can receive him by faith. So let's talk about the text that we read. All right, so Joel began the text by saying, yet even now. <clears throat> that would make sense to you if you understood that the Israelites at this point were a really, really long way from God. They were living terribly sinful, horribly unrepentant lives. They were kind of at one of their low points. But even now, at the low point, God is willing to forgive. God's always willing to forgive. So even now, even at this place where you guys are being terrible, wretched sinners, even now, 
Joel says, return to me. Or God says through Joel, actually, return to me. Return to God. Well, because of their sin and because of our sin, we are apart from God. Sin separates one from God. And sin pulls us away. But the process of repentance, uh, turning away from our sin, pulls us back to God. It returns us to God. So God is calling us to return to him through repentance. Return to his presence. Hi, Louise. Return uh, so that we can receive his blessings and his benefits. Now, when he says return, he says to return with all your heart. <clears throat> so we said here that genuine repentance and faith not only saves, but it's found deep in the heart. Um, so it involves an actual change of heart, not outward appearances, not going through the motions, but actually having your heart into the change. So return to me with all of your heart. He says, render, give to me your heart and not your garments. Now what that means is if you have genuine repentance, it's not only going to have external signs of repentance, but it's going to have that internal change of heart that we're talking about. Now back in the Old Testament era, um, when someone was sad or in mourning or repenting, it was just the common practice for them to tear their garments. That was a sign that they are in deep emotional distress, which repentance can cause. So God here is saying, look, don't just tear your garments for an outer show or act. I want you to actually mean it in your heart. So he wants our heart he wants genuine repentance, not just an outward show, because, of course, anybody can put on an outward show. And, in fact, when Jesus talks in Matthew 6, that's exactly what he's talking about. These two texts tie together really nicely. Now, he says he wants us to return with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Fasting, weeping, and mourning. Now, fasting, weeping, and mourning were the outward signs that genuine repentance is taping play, taking place. Of course, fasting is showing self-restraint from overindulgence. Weeping, obviously, is crying and being remorseful. Mourning is that inner hurt when you're sad. Um... Now he says that the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. <clears throat> So the nature of God is to show forgiveness that isn't necessarily deserved to show patience. And God is driven by love instead of anger. Now, what's interesting, if you compare this to, say, for example, Exodus 34. Exodus 34 is the passage where the Israelites worship the golden calf. So that was where Moses went away for like six weeks to go be with God on the mountain. And in six weeks, the people turned from, oh, we've got this great new covenant with God. God is our God. We love God too. Well, this Moses guy ain't coming back. We might as well do whatever we want. So they put all their gold together. They built an idol and they were worshiping and praying to the idol. 
which obviously is a bad thing. So when God came to confront the people worshiping the golden calf, this is what he said. I want you to know that I'm gracious, I'm merciful, I'm slow to anger, and I'm abounding in steadfast love. So the people in Exodus 34 are worshiping golden statues. The people in Joel 2 don't give two rips about God, but yet God is merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Now, the text says he will relent over disaster. So, sin brings about judgment. There's no getting around that. Sin must be punished. Sin must be paid for. And... God's purpose for disaster is not for punishment, but to lead us to repent so that we would not have to face judgment. And when we repent, God withholds judgment and disaster. So God would love to relent, hold back the disaster that's coming because of their sin and their lack of repentance and faith. Now in Joel chapter 1, God had just threatened a big plague of locusts that would have destroyed the entire nation because of their turning away from God. And, you know, again, it's important to understand. This isn't about God having some sort of ego problem where, you know, if we turn away from him, he gets mad or, or angry because we're not giving him his due attention. It's not about that. It's about the fact that God is the only source of life. So if you turn away from him, you're turning away from life. You're turning towards death. You're turning towards doom and destruction. There is no other way it'll turn out. And so when God gets mad over sin, he's not mad because his ego isn't getting stroked. He's mad because he knows that people who turn away from him are going down a path of destruction. He loves everybody, and he doesn't want that. So God really, really hates sin. So it's God's desire to pull back the disaster and the punishment because he wants people to repent so that they can be saved and not just repent as in going through the motions, but repent deep in their hearts. Who knows, Joel says. Joel isn't going to promise what God will do, but he's going to leave that up to God. But he says he might leave a blessing behind him. Joel is so confident that God would relent if the people repent that he's telling them that this is what you ought to expect would happen. He talked about a grain or drink offering for the Lord your God. So this is more confidence because Joel is letting them give consideration to giving offerings of thanksgiving because he knows that they're going to have something to be thankful for because God's going to bless them if they repent. Hi, Jeff. Thank you for joining us. Um, so then you start hearing his, his call. He declares that the people ought to blow the trumpet and call a solemn assembly. So, when the Old Testament Israelites would have a penitent worship service where they were going to repent and call upon God for mercy for their sin, that's how it started in the Old Testament. A trumpet would blow and a, people would assemble solemnly, sadly. I mean, seriously though, you know, Lent is a time where you take a hard look at sin 
if you really had it straight in your head, the gravity of sin, there's nothing to be happy about. It would be sad. There would be constant mourning. It would be like, you know, I remember, geez, like, in the, I'm old enough to remember the wake of uh, 9-11. I mean, that was the couple weeks and, and, you know, days, weeks, and a couple months after that. That was depressing. Uh, it was just like this black cloud hanging over you. Um, if, you know, you lose a loved one or something bad happens, that sadness that you're... That's what sin ought to cause in our minds and our hearts because, honestly, sin is that devastating and that destructive, and it's something that all of us have by nature. It's not good. So he says to blow the trumpet, call the sol solemn assembly, gather together solemnly, sadly, and then he talks about consecrating the congregation. Now again, this is all abnormal stuff. This isn't your, this isn't <clears throat> your run of the mill weekly thing, which, you know, at this time God's people were kind of going through the motions. Uh, you know, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to show up to church on the weekend. Yeah, okay, church is over. I'm going to go about my business. They had really gotten caught in a rut spiritually. And so Joel is calling for a change to get their attention. Consecrating the congregation would be a ceremonial purification that would happen before very special services would begin. So the prophet Joel is calling for a special penitent service again which is very very ash wednesday ish that's what ash wednesday is about assemble the elders gather the children even nursing infants so elders children nursing infants So the call to repentance to receive mercy and forgiveness is for literally all people. On one hand, God wants to give mercy for everybody. On the other hand, it's important to remember that everybody needs it. So from the elders to the church to even the children to even nursing infants, everybody needs forgiveness. Everybody needs to repent. Everybody needs to believe. Because everybody needs to be saved. Now that next line talked about the bridegroom leaving his room and uh, the bride leaving the chamber. This is such an important deal this is such a um important call to repentance that this would take priority even over weddings and honeymoons what could possibly be more important than being saved from eternal death so even bridegrooms and brides who have other things going on you guys need to come too because everybody needs to repent he said, let the priests weep. Let the priests weep. The priests are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the people. So if the priests aren't sad and grieved over their sin, why would the people be? So even the priests are to weep over sin's impact over them and all of the people and society and the world. And he says that the priests are to cry out, Spare your people, O Lord. <clears throat> S 
Spare your people, O Lord. So an Old Testament priest was not only to be a leader, a spiritual leader, they were also intercessors for the people of God. They were the middleman between God and the people. So the, pe the priests not only were God's spokesman to the people, they were also to take the people's requests and petitions, and they were the spokesman of the people to God. So they were the uh, intercessor. So the priests are going to cry out to God on behalf of the people to spare them, to save them. Now that is exactly how Moses interceded for the people after the whole golden calf incident. God was threatening to wipe them out off the face of the earth and blow them to smithereens. But Moses was begging to God on behalf of the people for him to spare them, give them the chance to repent, believe, and save them. Now, Joel then said, Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? So, if you're in a bind, and God is supposed to be the one to come save you, and he doesn't save you, you might say, well, where's God? Well, here, they're talking about not necessarily being saved from some type of earthly problem, but being saved from their sin, which therefore would save them from eternal hell. So, God having mercy on his people would be a better witness to the rest of the world than God actually destroying his people. God saving them through repentance and faith is going to give the rest of the world something to look at and to think about, right? I mean, if people didn't do right, God zapped them and blown them into smithereens, well, that's not going to be terribly attractive to the unbelieving world because that's not a solution. But yet, if, you know, God takes all of the trials and the problems and the yuckiness in the world and he actually bails people out and gives them eternal life, well, now that's something to stand up and take notice of. So if you stop and think about it, uh, God saving people is a better witness platform to the rest of the world than God destroying people. So he saves us. It said the Lord became jealous for his land. Um, in other words, God's wanting to reclaim his people from sin instead of sin having the run of the place and leading them towards death. You know, God looks at his people in the promise, the Old Testament promised land as something that needs to be reclaimed because sin has taken it over. God's jealous. God wants his people back. Not again, again, not because God has this ego issue, but because any other path away from God except towards God is going to lead to death, and God loves people. He doesn't want that, so he wants to save them. Now, Joel says that God had pity on his people. Again, he's a merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. So it would stand to reason that God, by his nature, has pity. So again, through repentance and faith, God saved his people. Now, it works the, it, this is the whole thing, it works the exact same way for us today. Because the Holy Spirit leads us to repent, leads us to believe in the promise of Jesus, leads us to have faith, so therefore we're saved. It's the same thing, nothing has changed in that regard. Now, then at the end, um, 
Joel talks about God sending them grain, wine, and oil. Um, God in his mercy not only saves, but he's also going to be a provider of earthly needs. Now again, this is right after a promise of destruction by locusts had been threatened had they not repented. But should they repent, turn back to God, be drawn back to life, not only are they going to be saved spiritually, God's going to provide for earthly needs as well. And he says, once he does that, you will be satisfied. In other words, you know, if you need if you need a little, God's not going to give you less than you need. God is going to give you everything you need and then some. And that, again, is both in terms of bodily needs and needs of the soul. And he will no more make you a reproach. Now, if you stop and think about it, the nation of Israel at this time was supposed to be godly people, they were supposed to have God on their side. <clears throat> but they're sitting here floundering. They're just, life isn't good. They're off the rails. And so the rest of the unbelieving world probably mocked them and made fun of them. But once God saves them, restores them because of their repentance and faith, well, now they're no longer going to be made fun of. But people are actually going to see, oh, this God stuff, that actually is the way to go. So, all right. That is our Old Testament lesson for Ash Wednesday. I haven't seen any questions. I'm going to assume that either A, you guys understand fully what I'm saying, or B, I am boring you people to tears. I'm going to take a chance and go with option A. So let's go ahead and put up. Let's switch over to the gospel lesson, Matthew 6, first verses 1 through 6, then second verses 16 through 21. We're going to split it in two parts, so let's take a look at the first part. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. For truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that, when, so that your giving may be done in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Okay, so now... Yeah, Barb and Jeff, you guys are making me feel a little bit better. Thank you so much. Um, so, if you were paying attention to our theme, let's take another look at our theme. Um, genuine, in repentance, genuine repentance and faith saves, and it's in the heart. Okay, so... Here in Joel 2, you heard a lot about God uh, saving the people. That part is heavy in Joel 2. Now, this part in Matthew 6 talks about being in the heart. Talks about, you know, 
repentance and faith being genuine versus you faking it to kind of put on a show so that other people think, oh, what a righteous, godly person you are. So that's kind of what you heard here. All right, so let's take a look. So the text talked about beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. So he talked about practicing your righteousness. Now, in Jewish Old Testament ceremonial life, the things that were the most important to them were giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. So that's what Jesus is addressing here. So should you choose to give to the needy, to prayer, and to fast, are you doing so because you genuinely want to do this because God has your heart? Or are you doing so because, well, if I don't do this, I'm going to get in trouble with God or it won't make me look good and I want to look good with people. So I don't really care about the God stuff, but I want to look good, right? So Jesus is uh, talking about the fact that there's a difference. So he says that if you do these things in order to be seen by others, that's a problem. A genuine desire to serve God and to serve others' people will not have a desire to be acknowledged for it by other people. You're not doing it for the praise and the glory. You're doing it because it's what you want to do. He says if, if one is doing these things in order to be seen by others, then they will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, in this whole section, every everything you, every time you hear this reward from the Father, that's talking about heaven. It's talking about being welcomed into eternal life as opposed to the alternative. So heaven comes through forgiveness, because again, we're not worthy of heaven. We need to be forgiven of our sin. So heaven comes through forgiveness, and forgiveness is given through repentance and faith. So a religion practice of just kind of going through the motions, you're not truly repentant, you don't truly have faith, but you're just kind of, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do, whatever. There is not going to be any forgiveness for that. These people had been going through the motions for centuries. God's calling them to repentance. So... He says, if you're going through the motions, sound no trumpet. Now, that's in direct contrast when um, Joel said to sound the trumpet and gather the assembly. Well, that's fine if you're repentant. But if you're not really repentant, you don't actually mean it, then don't waste your time sounding a trumpet. Um, and also, so if you're truly and genuinely repentant and you're turning to the Lord, hey, let's sound the trumpet, let's have this big ceremony where we return to him. But when you give to the poor, when you pray when you fast don't call attention to that stuff he's saying here don't call attention to the things that you do for God or for others so Lori says sometimes in my heart can be used as as an excuse when we don't get it right on the outside that's true how can we get it right in our hearts while ignoring while not ignoring the witness of the outward fruits that spring from a sincere yet fallible intention. She's right. So, 
if you have it right in your heart, you're going to get it right on the outward appearance. But if you don't have it right in your heart and you're focusing on the outward appearance, that might not go so well. And so what she says is absolutely true. If it's right in your heart, you're going to get it right externally. And that's kind of the whole point that Jesus is making here. But so many of the people at this time, like at this time, were just going through the motions. So sound no trumpet. Don't call attention to the good stuff you do. Because if you do good stuff because you genuinely want to, you don't need attention. If you want to genuinely help poor people, you don't need to be acknowledged for helping poor people. You get your happiness by helping poor people. That's all you need. He says, because this is what the hypocrites do in the synagogue. Jesus used the word hypocrite a lot in this passage. Jesus is being critical about those who aren't worshiping living with their heart. Outward appearances going through the motions, but they don't have it right eternally. internally. He says they do it so that they can be praised by others. Jesus says that the hypocrites do thing only do things only to get attention called to it. And that's just not how it works. So he says that they have received their reward. So the hypocrites whose heart isn't in it, they have received their reward. In other words, um, there isn't any blessings to come in the afterlife because what you have here is all you're going to get, which is a problem because that means you're not going to heaven, in other words. He says, do it so that your giving to the poor may be done in secret. If you do it in secret, the world doesn't know, nobody knows, so they're not going to give you accolades, and you're okay with that. But your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, this reward that Jesus is talking about, like we said, is heaven, eternal life. So that's what he said about giving to the poor. Now, he basically said the same thing about praying. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites and in the synagogues and on the street corners who do it so that they may be seen by others. So they, do, they make these great prayers so that others can say, oh, what a great prayer he is. He must really be this godly person. Well, if your heart's not in it, you're not a godly person. So you don't pray in order to be acknowledged. But Jesus said instead, when you pray, go into your room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. So Holy Spirit-driven prayer, prayer that comes from the heart, is only going to be concerned with getting the prayer to the Father as opposed to to having everybody know about it and receiving accolades for it. And Jesus said, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Again, heaven. Because one who gives to the poor and prays without the need of acknowledgement is doing it from the heart. That means their heart's in the right place. That means they'll be forgiven. That means they go to heaven. But somebody who is giving to the poor and praying only with the motivation of being acknowledged for it, 
their heart's not in the right place, Jesus says they've received their reward already. In other words, you've gotten all you're going to get, which means no heaven. Okay, so he talked about giving to the poor. He talked about praying. Next, he's going to talk about fasting. Now, Barb says, I'm in a Bible study, but thanks for the message. Recovery is slow, but I'm sure this point is painful. Chuck told me that you're doing good. Thank the Lord. Uh, yes, okay. So, let's look at the next section. Jesus said, when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting would be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay. So, he talked about giving... Oops, hold on. Ah. So, Jesus talked about giving to the poor. Jesus talked about praying. And now Jesus is talking about fasting. That's the third of the big disciplines that they... Um, that they um, used to do in Jewish Old Testament rituals. So when you fast. Now fasting again, a common Jewish discipline of the day that would involve abstaining for food or other things that a person um, needs or enjoys. And that was done either to instill sort of a self-reliance on God or maybe self-punishment for sin and this is sort of like sort of like the catholic practice of giving something up that you like for lent same same kind of idea he says if you're going to fast that's great but don't look gloomy like the hypocrites do and disfigure your face so you know what he's talking about. They're walking down the street and they're like, oh, 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 what's wrong? Oh, I'm fasting. I'm trying it so hard. Oh, you wonderful man. Please keep fasting uh, to please God, that sort of thing. You know, you, they want the accolades for their fasting instead of just doing it just because. They want to be noticed. So... Jesus said, instead, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. And if you're anointing your head and washing your face, people aren't going to know that you're fasting. Jeff, I need to fast. I don't think I can do it either. You are correct. Um, so, in other words, not only should you make a show of it, or should you not make a show of it, you should work to disguise the fact that you're doing it at all. Then he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Now, that's important to be kept in context, okay? Because he's not saying, Jesus isn't saying that sensible storing uh, of earthly material things is a bad idea. I mean, geez. Having a 401k or a pension is actually pretty smart to have something for retirement. Um, he's not saying that you shouldn't do these things. What he's saying is that those shouldn't be the focus of your life. Those shouldn't be the priority. Those aren't the most important things. Remember, this whole section has been about God being what's important in your heart and pleasing God.
doing the right thing, that's what's most important in your heart, sincerity. So if God is what matters, then earthly treasures aren't going to be the most uh, predominant thing in your mind and your heart. That don't mean that you should make wise choices, but as long as it's not what governs your focus and what your hope is in. He says the problem with putting your focus and your hope and trust in earthly treasures is that rust destroys them and thieves steal them. In other words, while they can serve a temporary purpose and uh, they can fulfill, fulfill earthly needs, the fact is that they don't last forever. The day is going to eventually come when you stand before God that earthly treasures are going to be completely irrelevant. And at that point, when you have this genuine repentance and faith in your heart, that's when you're going to be saved. So again, really, Ash Wednesday and Lent is about refocusing. Absolutely. Lori says it's all about good stewardship and more importantly, God-centered priorities. Yes. It's all about priorities. Um, it's all about using what God gives you uh, to his glory, which is taking care of yourself, taking care of your family, taking care of the poor. Um, you're not supposed to give everything away and live in a monastery in poverty. It's just not, it's at the same time, it's not supposed to be the most important thing. So, in other words, instead of lay, not laying up treasures on earth, lay up treasures in heaven where nothing gets destroyed or stolen. That's the alternative to earthly focus. You know what, um, Barb, I'm angry because I was looking, ah, I was looking for my bell, I couldn't find it. Lori does get a bell. Thank you, Barb. I was like, where is my bell, I said before this started. Somehow it found its way back there. I don't know how these things happen, but the bell is back, and Lori gets a bell. Um, so unlike earthly treasures, heaven and eternal life can't be, taking away, can't be taken away from you by the world, so that would, would make sense. That's the ultimate focus of your life. So when you store up treasures in heaven... By being good stewards, as Lori says, of what God gives us, being genuine in repentance and faith in your heart, all of that comes through the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is at work, that's what happens. And then he closes by kind of tying it all together. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So... What our heart is focused on and what is important to us is one and the same. The Holy Spirit's going to lead us to treasure heavenly spiritual stuff, God, while our sinful nature wants us to chase after things of the world. All right. So let's take a look at our summary for Ash Wednesday, putting all of this together. God will forgive the genuinely repentant believer. Now, genuine repentance and faith are internal, and they're not to be gauged only by outward signs. Joel 2 tells us of God's mercy shown to the genuinely repentant, and Matthew 6 condemns merely outward expressions of repentance while showing us the actions that genuine repentance will lead us to. In other words, in the heart. So Ash Wednesday reminds us of our mortality because of our sin and that our nature leads us to death. But we are taken from death to eternal life through forgiveness in Jesus and we receive that forgiveness through genuine Holy Spirit given repentance and faith in your heart. All right. So that's a wrap for another week. Now, uh, a couple of a uh, couple of announcements before I head out. Uh, of course, the reminder to join us every Sunday as we do for our worship service here uh, from our sanctuary at Trinity Lutheran 
Church in Lombard, Illinois. Um, we'll be back this Sunday at 9 a.m. Central, as always, with our uh, Transfiguration Worship Service. But also, next Wednesday starts the season of Lent. Now, next Wednesday, we will not be here at 6 p.m. for a Bible study, but we will be here at 6 p.m. for a worship service on Ash Wednesday. So you can look for a live-streamed worship service this coming Wednesday at 6 p.m. So no Bible study next week, just a worship service instead for Ash Wednesday. Then going on into the season of Lent, most of our Wednesday nights will be like we did with Advent, where you'll see us live stream from Parish Hall. We're kind of informally hanging out, we're eating, and we're having a Lent-based uh, Bible study. There will be one or two worship services mixed in throughout the season. And so that would then get us all the way up to Holy Week where we will announce our schedule and our streaming plans uh, at that time as that approaches. So join us this coming Sunday for worship uh, at 9 a.m. Central. Join us next Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central, not for a Bible study, but for a live streamed worship service for our Ash Wednesday service here. Uh, and Lori, as she points out, if you are local, you can come to our uh, Ash Wednesday services in person. They are at 11 a.m., which is not live streamed, and 6 p.m., which is uh, broadcast online. So thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you at many of our online events that are coming up. And I pray that the Lord would very richly bless your evening.